Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in UK and uh, today we're going to uh, discuss case number three from our Facebook page. This is a case that I've seen myself a few years ago and um, she was a lady who was 88 years old. Uh, presented to ED in a hospital with no PCI facility with three episodes of syncope. There was no clear associated chest pain, um, but she was complaining of shortness of breath and a tight chest. Her observations were a heart rate of 114, a blood pressure of 110 over 75, her respiratory rate was 29 and her saturation was 92% on room air. Reaching that far with her, I've had a provisional diagnosis in my head, and I think you're all thinking the same. This all sounds like a case of acute pulmonary embolism. So my decision was to um, investigate and treat as such. So I decided to uh, cannulate the lady, take some bloods and uh, request a chest X-ray and get an ECG for her and probably to start treating her with some anticoagulants. So an ECG was done for this lady and it carried a bit of a surprise to me. Here we go. This is the ECG of this lady. I want you now to um, press the pause button, have a quick look at the ECG, start analyzing it, think about it and think about the presentation and try to come up with a final diagnosis. Welcome back. Um, I hope you've got an idea now about what's going on. So looking at this ECG, um, it is, uh, it's got some features of pulmonary embolism, but the main concerning feature to me was this, this part of the ECG, this concerning ST elevation in AVR, V1 and V2. Remember that I've seen this case in a hospital with no PCI facility. So this is a really big call for me um, that now I need to decide whether to anticoagulate this patient and admit her to the local medical team in my hospital as pulmonary embolism or to immediately transfer this patient to the nearest PCI center as acute STEMI. Let's start from the clinical presentation first. This lady presented with syncope. This is something that we've covered recently and we talked about what things we should look at when we analyze an ECG for a patient who presents with syncope. So this was the differential diagnosis that we've covered before. Acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias and pulmonary embolism. So three no-brainers and then two intervals to look at the PR interval and the QT interval, whether short or long for both, and then three congenital problems, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Brogada syndrome, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And as you can see here, the two differential diagnoses that we had for our case were ACS and pulmonary embolism, and they are both in here. Now let's move on and analyze the ECG. So this was the ECG of this lady, and as you can see, it's, uh, it is not a normal ECG. We've got the right bundle branch block in here, and this is because of the RS R dash that we can see in uh, here in V1. And uh, also, uh, we've got a right-ish axis deviation. It's not a banged or right axis deviation, but to be honest, this S wave in V1 is, uh, in lead one, is a deep uh, S wave, so there is an element of right-ish axis deviation. There is also an S1 uh, and T3. I'm not too convinced that we've got a good Q wave in here, but I think we've got a reasonable uh, S uh, wave in lead one. And lastly, we've got sinus tachycardia, so the heart rate here is 113. So with all these findings, um, yeah, these are findings that are pointing towards pulmonary embolism. So what else can be there in a pulmonary embolism ECG? So the signs of PE in an ECG can be a new right bundle, and right axis deviation, sinus tachycardia, 
this uh, this is the commonest finding in pulmonary embolism cases uh, as an abnormality because the commonest ECG for a PE patient is the normal ECG. Um, and actually it can be seen in 30 to 50% of cases. S1Q3T3 or S1Q3 uh, and tachyarrhythmias, so either supraventricular or ventricular. But the question now is, can PE present with an ST elevation or not? If you do a quick literature review regarding this question, you will find that the answer is yes. You can have an ST elevation with acute pulmonary embolism. P is well known to cause ST segment and T wave changes, including ST elevation and depression in about 50% of cases with PE. And this is uh, thought to be because of the right heart strain that happens with acute pulmonary embolism. The usual leads uh, that will uh, show ST elevation are AVR, V1 and V2, but there were some reports about ST elevation and inferior leads as well with PE. Interestingly, having ST elevation in a case of acute pulmonary embolism was found to be a poor prognostic sign. So let's go through the literatures and see what they say. So here is our first um, uh, publication from the Cardiology Journal in 2011. And this uh, was about the ECGM prognosis in patients with acute pulmonary embolism. And what they found here was that having an ST elevation in lead V1 is one of the independent predictors of death during hospitalization. They've also found that the ST elevation in lead V1 and AVR were independent predictors of complications during hospitalization. Here is another one from the American Journal of Emergency Medicine published in 2014 and it was about ECG abnormalities in patients with acute pulmonary embolism and cardiogenic shock. And the author said in the conclusion of this um, uh, paper that um, in patients with acute pulmonary embolism having a low voltage ECG right bundle and ST elevation in V1 was associated with cardiogenic shock. Another one that was published in 2016 uh, talking about ST elevation in V1 to V4 in a case of acute pulmonary embolism and in this one so the author said at the end that ST elevation in lead V1 to V3 in cases with acute pulmonary embolism uh, identifies a subset of patients who are and intermediate or high risk uh, patients. And interestingly, the recommendations from the author in this paper was uh, if the clinical presentation of the case um, is more towards acute pulmonary embolism rather than acute coronary syndrome, the author suggested immediate rather than delayed initiation of anticoagulation and to get a CTPA rather than to treat as a STEMI. And here is another case report uh, that was published 2004 about a massive pulmonary embolism case with ST elevation in leads V1 to V3. And this case was successfully thrombolized with tenecteplase. And here is the ECG of this case. And um, it is a really interesting ECG looking at V1 to V3. Significant, really concerning ST elevation that really mimics STEMI and also there is an ST elevation in AVR that is again really concerning from the ACS point of view. But again, this case was confirmed via CT to have a pulmonary embolism and was thrombolized successfully. Moving on to the next paper, and this one was talking about shock, ST elevation and massive pulmonary embolism. And here is the ECG that they've discussed. And as you can see, we've got an ST elevation in AVR, ST elevation in V1, ST elevation in V2, that mimic our case actually, and, and again, confirmed PE rather than uh, acute coronary syndrome. Here is another one um, that reported ST elevation in the inferior leads in a case with confirmed pulmonary embolism. And this is the ECG that they've published for this case. And as you can see here, if you look closely because the ECG is of low voltage, you will notice there is an ST elevation in 2, 3 AVF. And actually, there is no significant ST elevation or no ST elevation at all in V1, V2, V3. 
O N A V R. And if you keep going, you will find loads of papers talking about ST elevation in um, in cases of acute pulmonary embolism. So it's not that uncommon looking at the literatures. It's been reported in so many uh, case reports and um, and in so many uh, publications. So back to our case. So this was the lady who presented to me with a recurrent syncopal event, a presentation that was clinically uh, suggestive for acute pulmonary embolism, but the ECG showed ST elevation in AVR, ST elevation in V1, ST elevation in V2. So I was concerned about this. Uh, what happened to this lady was we've done a bedside echo that showed no signs of right heart strain, but also showed no signs of regional wall motion abnormality. So the decision was not to transfer the patient to a PCI center and to get an immediate CTPA. And here we go. So a nice saddle shape thrombus that uh, you can see uh, here with an occlusion here and an occlusion there. So bilateral uh, submassive pulmonary embolism. This lady um, hasn't been thrombolized and that was um, following a long discussion with the medical team regarding the best treatment modality for this lady. Uh, so considering her age and the other comorbidities, uh, we decided not to thrombolize her, uh, especially knowing that the blood pressure wasn't low, lactate was normal, so she was in a submassive PE rather than a massive PE. Here is another case that I've seen within just a few weeks from the first case, and um, it, that was in the same hospital, the one with no PCI facility. Um, and again, this was a 78-year-old lady uh, who presented with sudden onset of shortness of breath, hypoxia, low blood pressure, a bedside echo showed big right ventricle. So she was too unwell to get a CTPA. So the decision was to thrombolize her as a case of a massive PE without a CTPA. And she was thrombolized successfully. She's had a CTPA after thrombolysis that confirmed the diagnosis of PE. Her ECG on arrival was this one. And if you look at this one, you will notice that we've got S1Q3T3. We've got an incomplete right bundle branch block looking at the RSR dash and V1. Um, the heart rate is probably on the high side towards the 100. Um, but also we've got here the ST elevation in AVR, V1, and maybe in V2. And this is it about our case this week. So in summary, P has been reported to cause ST elevation um, in the ECG and the leads that were reported commonly were AVR, V1 and V2, but there were some case reports about ST elevation and inferior leads as well with acute pulmonary embolism. And the ST elevation is usually associated with um, poor prognosis when it comes to acute pulmonary embolism. And this is it about this week. So thank you so much uh, for listening and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.